The year was new and fresh. The charts were extra special. Especially great for like in 78. They were so thrilling they gave you newsflash. Newsflash people, it's January the 8th, 1979 and this chart is metal good. Disco is dead. Long live the top 10. Kicking off this week with a section that is so great it like James Brown just wants to step right back and kiss itself. Hello and goodbye. And there's one new recording to the top 10 this week, Billy Joel's splashy showstopper, My Life, which comes all the way up from 17 last week. Despite arriving so emphatically, it hung around for just five weeks and got as high as number five. Departing this week, it's Donna Summer's rather odd version of Jimmy Webb's MacArthur Park, after a month amongst the elite, getting no higher than number eight. In the USA, Summer was in the middle of an amazing and unheralded run. She was the first and so far only artist to have three consecutive double albums make number one in the US, and she had more top ten hits in the decades 76 to 86 than any other female artist. All the fellas, only Stevie Wonder, Paul McCartney, and Elton John had more. The biggest hit entering the charts this week is Come On Aussie Come On by the Mojo Singers. Mojo was an advertising agency and the song was the jingle that was used to advertise Kerry Packer's breakaway World Series cricket competition. For those in the Americas, imagine a billionaire, perhaps a New York property developer gone rogue, basically buying up all of the best Major League Baseball players and starting his own private league. Or for the Europeans, just imagine Manchester City. I was the only kid in my cricket club who sided with World Series cricket. Even then, I could see the superiority of free market solutions. Yet, ironically, when Rupert Murdoch tried to do the same thing with rugby league in the 1990s, I stood in vehement, fulminating and vituperative opposition to him. That's because Rupert Murdoch and his idiot children are reprehensible lizard creatures and Kerry Packer. Packer and Murdoch's fathers were deadly enemies. It was an Aussie legend. Anyway, Come On Aussie Come On was a genuine earworm and after debuting at 55, it hit the top on February 12 after six weeks on the chart where it stayed for two weeks becoming the 22nd biggest hit of the year. Leaving the charts this week was a 32 week veteran. Former eight week number one, You're the One That I Want by that spunky little Aussie songbird Olivia Newton John and some rando. Thus far the third biggest hit we have ever seen on our chart. Let's take a moment to reflect on the passing of a champion. The next number one is in the top 10 this week and it's our old friend Ward Otters with one of his top songs, You Mix Hot Kidneys. Can you work it out? Answers at the very end. Number 10 this week is the biggest hit on the chart, the five week number one for the Commodores, Three Times a Lady. This is the sixth biggest selling single in Motown's history, although Motown never did RIAA certification, so it is an educated guess. One of five songs in that top 10 to feature the man with the second sexiest moustache in this video. Modesty forbids me naming the first. Nine is Dire Straits, which is surely one of the worst band names ever. I mean, seriously, how much effort went into that? A band which turned out to be so relentlessly, facelessly corporate spends zero hours at the beginning on branding. Anyway, with probably their most well-known and enduring song, Sultans of Swing. On a more serious note, my best friend in high school, a chap who pretty much taught me to play guitar, was obsessed with Mark Knopfler's tone, so much so that he super glued a matchstick into his pickup switch so that it was always stuck on bridge middle. Sultans sort of malingered in the top 10, not doing much of anything for five weeks, getting as high as six. Dire Straits were incredibly popular across that most dire of straits, the Tasman Sea. Their Brothers in Arms is the biggest selling album ever in New Zealand, selling one unit for roughly every 14 New Zealanders, or one unit for every 350 sheep. Eight is Billy Joel's Busy My Life off his 52nd Street album, an album which remains an enduring favourite. Joel, peerless as a songcrafter as he was in the late 70s to mid 80s, wasn't exactly a genius when it came to managing his personal affairs in this period. After breaking up with his first wife and manager in an epically nasty divorce, Joel then unaccountably hired her brother as his manager. Unaccountable is the operative term there because Weber then proceeded to take him for far more than his sister ever had, stealing from Joel on an industrial scale and, get this, taking a mortgage over the publishing rights to Joel's songs. Possibly distracted by having punched legendarily above his own weight and marrying Christy Brinkley, it took him many years to realise what this grifter had done to him and proceed to sue the son of a bitch for $90 million. Weber simply declared bankruptcy and Joel ended up with less than $2 million of his fortune back. 
Thankfully, he got some good advice and managed to leverage his publishing back by playing it off against fat recording contracts and became, well, almost as fabulously wealthy as he deserves to be. He and Brinkley split in 1994. They're still close friends, but it's fair to say that Billy hasn't aged as finely as Christie. The stupendous seven is the lady who is beloved by the ladies who love ladies, and was no doubt the subject of many slow jams at closing time at the Alliance Hotel on St Paul's Terrace in the mid-80s, and if anyone got that rather obscure reference to the Brisbane gay club scene 40 years ago, well done and hi. And Murray with the tender heart and you needed me. This was a solid hit due in some part to the fact that in 1979 we had a dedicated country music station in Brisbane which would have had this on heavy rotation and it got to number two the week before Christmas 78. After a very respectable 23 weeks it faded off the charts in the last week of March. Well if seven was stupendous six is simply silly. Boney M's epoch defining Rasputin. Two weeks at number one at the start of December just gone was its reward for this German assortment of lip syncing models who pre milly milly vanilli. I guess, given they were sham group, they should have been called Phony M. Time for the trade up where we look at the records on this week's charts, which in a fair world would have been top 10 hits, but our local record buyers are idiots, so this is what they got, and there is a trove of them this week. Buckle up, you are not going to believe the stuff we poo pooed en masse. First up, Cheap Tricks Magnum Opus Surrender, which got no higher than number 32. This is a bit of a funny history because despite the low peak, it stayed on the charts for five months, and I wouldn't mind betting this spent more consecutive weeks at number 99 on its way out than any other record ever. So long, in fact, that the follow-up, California Man, entered the charts, wobbled up to 91, left the charts all the time while this was marooned at 99. The Angels with the iconic Take A Long Line, a song I've seen played so many times live, headbanging to it, may well be the reason that I'm bald. Spent 26 weeks on the charts, peregrinating up to number 29. It's long chart run, no doubt bringing a smile on the face of good old FIFA Riccobono, as she toted up sales reports at Albert Records. One of the Who's best known songs, Who Are You? The song responsible for the first time I have heard the word fuck on the radio. Stormed its way up to the charts but was halted at number 23. This would have entered the charts the week after Keith Moon died. <laughs> Some tribute. One of the last and best hurrahs for disco, A Taste of Honey's Boogie Oogie Oogie, was floating about having topped out at an unworthy number 13. And it was sad testament to just how far ABBA had fallen when Summer Night City, one of their really underappreciated singles, failed also to get no higher than 13. But the biggest almost of the week was City Boys 5705, an early Mutt Lang production which only got to number 11. Well, let's put that shameful episode behind us. Number five is a former number one, Kiss You All Over by Exile, which spent a week denying Anne Murray before Christmas. Exile are a band with a bewildering history. After working in a constantly changing variety of styles and revolving door of members, from country to blue-eyed soul, they eventually had a crack at disco with super producer Ozzy Mike Chapman, who thought the band wasn't much chop. Song uses two vocalists because Chapman just kept recording both of them until he could patch the song together and cover all of the iffy breathing and wobbly pitching. And of course it was a huge hit. 25 weeks on the charts and Chapman got a measure of cred back when his production, Heart of Glass by Blondie, spent five weeks on top in April and May, and then Racy spent another 12 weeks or so on number one with two other singles later in the year. Number four is You Don't Bring Me Flowers by Barbara Streisand and Neo Diamond. Now, regular viewers will know that Mr. Diamond has no finer friend than this series, but I have to say he is the bad guy on this record. The record was originally going to be a duet between Barbs and Marvin Gaye, but Marvin was, as usual, another dick and wouldn't do it. Of course, that means the song was only 1% of its total potential, because truth be told, Neil is duller than the Olympic sloth marathon, more lethargic than a statue on Clonopin, and heavier than a sack full of phone books. And Barbs rises to his level. Marv would at least have challenged her. Neil just turned it into an easy paycheck. Number three is a record so awful that it is truly great. One of the great cases of the artist slumming it and getting away with it by having a ridiculously good time. Rod Stewart's utterly ludicrous Do You Think I'm Sexy, where he relentlessly roasts himself every inch of the way and we're all in on the joke. A future two-week number one. There are five former future or current number ones this week. It is a sing-along, daggy dancing classic, and it has stood every test of time. And Stuart donated all the money from it to UNICEF. Of course he ripped it off from Yorge Ben's Taj Mahal, but he fessed up straight away and settled amicably with the great Brazilian. This was to be Stuart's third number one of the 1970s, a total only bettered in the decade by ABBA. 
Number two, oh god, I've been waiting ever since this theory started to feature this song. Car plan pour moi. Roughly, this life for me or this is working for me by Plastique Bertrand, a Belgian DJ. The song never made number one. It peaked at two this and next week. But it hung about on the charts for six months and was a staple at every blue light disco I habituated through the summer and autumn of 1979. Now, a blue light disco was a dance that the police used to hold to try and keep kids off the streets in the drug-riddled feculent shithole that I grew up in. And I'm, I'm not kidding, it was horrible. And in 50 years, it's gotten even worse. Blue light discos were where I learned that A, I am at heart a dancing machine, and B, girls are fun. Writing this, I got curious. What is he yammering on about in that song? So here are the French lyrics, roughly translated. Wham bam, my cat Splash is rolling about on my bed. He swallowed his tongue as he drank all my whiskey. As for me, I hardly slept. I feel empty and reprimanded. I had to sleep in the gutter, where I had a flash of inspiration. <laughs> in four colours. Okay, let's go. A babe came around in my house. She looked like a cellophane doll with curly hair. She was wearing a plaster and had a hangover. She drank my beer in a large rubber glass. <laughs> like an Indian in their igloo. This works for me. <laughs> this works for me. Okay, let's go. That babe was such a bitch. What a vibration. Coming on the doormat. File down, ruined, empty, but happy. You are the king of the divan, she says to me in passing. I am the king of the divan. Okay, let's go. Mind your own. Keep your nose out. Don't harm my planet. Today's not the day the sky will fall down around my ears or that I will have to go without a drink. This works for me. Okay, let's go. My baby up and left. She walked out on me. It's a shitty situation. She broke everything. The sink, the bar. She left me all alone like a total jerk. Stuck here faced with the aftermath. You really needed to know that, didn't you? You know, the hardest part of writing these videos is finding these three facts to kick off this segment. The formal term for sunbathing is application. While Video Kill the Radio Star was the first video broadcast on MTV, that was just a test broadcast that only went to a select market in New Jersey. The first video broadcast station-wide was You Better Run by Pat Benatar. The three northernmost provinces of Canada are larger than the nation of India, the seventh largest nation in the world, but their entire population would fit comfortably inside the largest cricket stadium in India. Here are some even more mind-blowing facts. It's Val's fantastic world of facts. The biggest riser on our charts this week is oddly Mary's Boy Child by Phony M, which is up 20 places to 33. Uh, Christmas was last week, guys. Biggest faller is Substitute by Aussie Van Peaches, down 9 spots to 37. Highest debutant this week is Future Chart Topper, Come On Aussie, Come On, which was pounded down like a machine when it popped in at 55. And the longest running song on the chart is by La Belle Epoque, which hung in for 28 weeks, including a single one at number one. In America, the number one were Aussie champs, the Bee Gees, with Too Much Heaven, and in the UK, the village people held sway with their PR to clean living and Christian comradeship, YMCA. This time last year, the number one in town was at five weeks into its an interminable number one dom, Mull of Kintyre by Wings, and a year in the future, which regrettably would not be sufficient time for us to get deprogrammed from the horrors of Mull of Kintyre, it would be Video Kill the Radio Star by Buggles, bravely holding off the irresistible Michael Jackson. The number one album in town this week was 52nd Street by Billy Joel, and the third of its five weeks on top, and the fifth bestseller from 1979. <laughs> So, continuing a series that seems to have been profitable for us, we poke a bit of fun at it here, but Billy Joel sells records by the truckload. 52nd Street was worldwide the 8th biggest selling album of the year, shifting thus far just over 8.25 million copies. It was the 47th biggest seller of the whole 1970s. Here are the 12 biggest sellers of that wonderful decade. Beginning is 1971's Tapestry from Carole King, which was the record that truly showed the industry just how many it could sell. Every second of this is great. Boston came to epitomise a slightly sterile, high-sheen, family-friendly American rock machine that sold like nobody's business in the mid-70s to mid-80s. In 1978, Grease was the word and the one we all wanted. Still pops up in the top 100 now and then, and after Hot August Night is the record most often found in charity shop bins. Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road is pretty much a perfect record to put on when kids ask you, Daddy, what did that man who looked like an overstuffed armchair do to get so famous? He's done some better things for sure, but he's done a whole lot worse. 
It's like the Cadbury roses of this album. The Warp, I think, Floyd sold 33 million copies. I myself could listen to it 33 million times and still not get it, but what do I know? Set me to write in the comments. I bet you're surprised to see this this low. It's a bit like Yellow Brick Road. It's not the best of everything they did, but it's the most concise and fun distillation of everything they could do. The magnificent, the challenging, and the gloriously stupid. Rumours was for a time the biggest seller of all time, and I think it deserved it. People pick at this and that, but that's just being niggardly as far as I'm concerned. This is an impeccable album for a great songs, human song, and wonderful play. Saturday Night Fever replaced Rumours as the biggest seller of all time. In 1978, the record industry shipped an all-time record 341 million album. Thus, this, Rumours, and our number two were primary drivers here. To give you some perspective, 1978 was the biggest selling year for pre-CD record sales. The biggest selling year post-CDs was 2000, when just under a billion CDs were shipped. Saturday Night Fever is a wonder. It's a double album stuffed with filler instrumentals and you don't mind. It was just so many great songs all the way through it that it makes it one big fun journey. Four, their greatest hits by Eagles. Released in early 1976, it is reputedly the biggest selling album in the US with 38 million in that market alone. The sales figures on this album have always been highly disputed with discrepancies between reporting and sales as high as 8 million copies. All of the other Eagles compilations, and there have been plenty, haven't sold half what this one has claimed to have sold combined. 287 days after they released their greatest hits, they made an immediate redundant by dropping Hotel California at 8 week number 1. No such dispute hangs over this record, and it has been a steady seller since day one. Often bookended with rumours as the iconic album of Zera, in my opinion it pales to rumours in every department by some length. But that's a bigger argument for another place and a whole nother time. Biggest selling album ever in Australia, Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell is at number two with an amazing 43 million copies. It still sells 200,000 copies a year worldwide. It's gloriously stupid maximalism and much as it may seem inconsequential it's just too much fun to be ignored top album of the decade is pink floyd's moody dark side of the moon with 45 million and, and still shifting serious units i think it is like most of floyd's music terribly dry and witless but this one at least manages to conjure some interesting textures where if you're in a situation where there's no alternative not to physically engage with the music it can make for some interesting listening the third biggest seller of all time it's sold over a million copies in australia and only 13 albums have ever managed that so only the 80s to go and that means it's time for the beast with the beats monty the safety monkey the drummer's to number one at number one for the second week is ymca by the village people one of the most delightfully silly but eternally memorable artifacts of the 1970s this came very close to being the first song ever to be number one in Australia, the UK and the US at the same time. Hitting number two this week in the US but getting no higher while holding down the top spot here and in London. It was this week that the famous dance steps of this song first appeared on American Bandstand. I had never been able to do that dance and my children had actually stopped me attempting to do it by manually correcting my moves on occasions. I apparently always get the aim wrong. Well, Chillum, that is how the cow ate the cabbage this week in the first top 10 for what might be my favourite top 40 year of all time. In 76 episodes, this is only the second time we've been here, and there's still two years, 1978 and 82, that we've only been to once. So we'll have to see about that, and maybe we will. When, if the good lords are willing and the creeks don't rise, we come back with another instalment next week. Kish.